Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, being here with us today for this uh, Pro Tools Tech webinar that we have. My name is Gil Gowing. I am a uh, audio solution specialist uh, here at Avid, and I have Tony Joy and uh, Jeff Komar with me today. And uh, we're going to be uh, taking you through uh, some of our latest software releases for both Pro Tools and Yukon, kind of going over and touching base uh, uh, what what we kind of released in those two uh, big releases over the last few weeks. Um, hope everyone is uh, staying safe out there still and uh, um, kind of hope we're kind of getting at the end of this and uh, going to come out of this uh, on the other side and uh, looking forward to in the hopefully in the near future to get back out there and start to see everybody in person. All right, so uh, to kind of get going before we actually jump into uh, the presentation, just want to go over some housekeeping features first. Uh, so first thing is, is because there'll be uh, three of us presenting and we'll be kind of going back and forth and uh, looking at uh, some different screen shares, but then we'll also be on the screen. Best way to, to kind of get the most out of this is to go up in the uh, top corner and uh, change your view to gallery view. That's going to be the best thing. Now, there are some uh, other people that um, are going to be helping us out on the social platforms out there from our team. Um, and there's also some people that will be here on, behind the scenes. So another thing you can do is to kind of go up to where your name is. You'll see three little dots and you can get a pull down menu and just hide all the non-video participants so that basically you'll just see uh, the three of us uh, that will be um, uh, doing the presenting today. Um, so we, uh, to, we will be taking questions. We have some time set aside at the uh, end of the uh, presentation to kind of take those questions. We possibly maybe interject some of those as well. But to, to get the questions to us, there is a Q&A section. If you'll just uh, uh, open that up and you can type your question in there. We've got people that will be monitoring that and uh, we'll do what we can uh, to be able to answer those questions. Uh, those of you out there on the uh, other social platforms, we do have people monitoring uh, those comment sections. And if some questions come in, uh, they will do what they can to get them back over to us and we can answer those uh, live as well. So just real quick, want to talk about uh, what we're going to be covering today with our agenda. Uh, first off, we want to kind of take you through what's new with Pro Tools 2021.6, which came out uh, a, a few weeks ago now. Um, and then uh, UConn 2021.6. And so we're going to talk about what's new for S4 and S6, as well as what's new for uh, UConn 2021.6 for S1, S3, DOC, and Avid Control. And then, like I said, at the end of the presentations, we will then uh, go about uh, answering those questions that we uh, get from the Q&A. So uh, that's pretty much it for kind of uh, getting the housekeeping out of the way. So I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, get it turned over to Tony Joy and have him take you through what's new in Pro Tools. Tony. Thank you, Gil. Let me share my screen real quick. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. So very excited to have everyone join us. So here at Avid, we are a customer-centric company and we take lots of feedback from our customers. And we introduced high retention last year with carbon and it was an instant hit, right? Anyone who tried carbon, listened to it, they were like, oh my, this is life changing. Your workflow changes for good. Once you listen to a sub one millisecond latency. And this was a very, good entry point to people who are not used to HDX cards. And for those of you who are already HDX customers, you invested in us so long ago, and we are investing back in you, into the product. And we are now bringing the, all the good features of hybrid engine that came with Carbon to HDX cards now at no additional cost. What does this mean? It's huge, actually. So now with hybrid engine, you can you get the best of both worlds, right? Your engine power is not dedicated to just your CPU or the HDX. You are combining the best of both worlds to maximize the power that you have from both the HDX and your computer. So you can run huge sessions 
and optimize both your CPU's power and the HDX card chips to bring the best sounding mixes out. With this release with 21.6, we are also increasing the IO count for both Pro Tools Ultimate and Pro Tools Software. So now you can have up to 64 channels of IO at all sample rates, that's key. So if you have an interface that can do, let's say 40 microphone inputs, you can actually use that with Pro Tools and bring in all of those microphone inputs to either Pro Tools Software or Pro Tools Ultimate. As it goes without saying, our HD interfaces, both the HDX card and the HD native also supports a maximum of 64 channels of IO. Increased voice counts. So going back to hybrid engine, this is going to change the paradigm for HDX workflows. So before your number of voices were limited to the number of HDX cards, with hybrid engine, you get 2,048 voices at all sample rates. Think about it. You could be running a 192 kilohertz session and have up to 2,048 voices. This is huge. If you are not using an HD interface, you can still use Pro Tools Ultimate and get up to 2,048 tracks. So you can now run multiple huge sessions on your machine, assuming your computer can run it. Having said that, hybrid engine is so brilliant. Uh, just having one HDX card and a powerful machine takes your workflow to a completely different level. Sub one millisecond latency being key. We have also increased the maximum number of audio tracks for Pro Tools, Pro Tools software. So if you are using just the normal Pro Tools software, you can now have up to 256 mono or stereo tracks, again, at all sample rates. So in the beginning, I mentioned how we take customer feedback, right? So we have, we listen to our customers mostly through our Avid Customer Association or abbreviated as ACA. And one of the feedback we always received was delay compensation for side chains on a native system. This has always been a well loved feature for our HDX customers. And now starting with Pro Tools 21.6, you can actually have delay compensation for side chains on a native system as well. So again, if you are a customer and if you have feedback for us, please know that we listen to you and we bring these features out for every one of you. And this can be a feature in Pro Tools or an accessibility feature, right? So we work very hard towards accessibility features too. And then we also have small things that make your workflow much more easier. One of those things is changing a track channel width. So let us say you have a stereo track and you want to turn it into mono or into 5.1. Now you can do it with just a single click. And we will look at it in a minute uh, through some screenshots. Talking about small things that make your workflow much faster, efficient, and easier, you can also drag and drop now plugins between diff tracks with different channel widths. So you might have an EQ, for example, on a mono track. And assuming that plugin can actually exist in a 5.1 instantiation, you can actually move that plugin from your mono or stereo track to a quad or 5.1 or 7.1.2 track. Again, one of those small things that's going to make life much more easier. So how easy is it to do this? Well, as easy as right clicking a track header, that is one way of doing this. So you can right click on the track's name and in the pop-up menu, you can see you have a change track width option. And from that option, you can choose which width you wanna change that specific track to. Another way of doing this is from the menu. So if you go to the track menu, you have a change track width option there as well. If you look closely in all these menus and also in the create new tracks dropdown, there's a new show hide option. What this does, is it allows you to hide the channel widths that you might not be using on a daily basis. So in my specific workflow, I almost never use LCRS. I don't want to see that in the list. So again, this is a very small thing, but it adds to the elegance of your workflow, reduces clutter so that, so that you can focus on things you should be doing. So this menu now allows you to hide the channel widths throughout that uh, system. So, this is a screenshot of the playback engine and the preferences. 
the reason why I want to show this to you is there's been a few different things I want to point out. In the playback engine, now you have the hybrid engine with HDX, right? And you actually can turn it off if you wanted to. There's very few instances where you might want to do that, but if you had to do it, yes, you can turn off the hybrid engine and you will get what we now call the classic HDX workflow. So that's at the top by the settings. Under the optimization sec section, you see a new option called limit number of real time threads. And as you can see in the screenshot, I have it disabled. And this is what you should be doing in most cases. And what does it do? So if you're running Pro Tools and that's all you are running on your machine, you should leave it off. And what that means is with the setting off, Pro Tools gets access to all the cores, all the engine power, all the CPU power of your computer. But let's say you are also running some other CPU intensive software on the same machine at the same time. For example, SoundMiner. So you are moving back and forth between Pro Tools and SoundMiner. And if you see SoundMiner is struggling or freezing, it could be that Pro Tools is using all the DSP power of your computer. In such a workflow, you can actually enable this option. And what it does is that Pro Tools knows there is someone else in the system trying to use these things. So it reserves some CPU power for other softwares. The next option below it is the Intel Turbo Boost. Again, I would normally leave it on in most of the cases when I'm mixing or mastering. What it does is it allows your Intel systems to boost, use the Turbo Boost function to give you more, even more power within your Pro Tools. However, it does increase the fan speed. So in a workflow where you might have your Mac Mini or iMac in a single room recording situation, you don't want the high fan noise. So if you're about to go into a tracking session, you might want to turn that setting off. The next screenshot uh, shows the user-centric, user-requested feature that we introduced, which is the sidechain compensation for native systems. So that's the option to turn it on. In addition to all this stuff, we also added QuickTime improvements to this release, which is 21.6. Now you can do same as source bound to MOV with DNxHD, DNxHR, and Apple ProRes. You can also import and bounce H.265 videos into a Pro Tools session. So if you have a video that was shot on iPhone, you don't have to use a third-party software to convert it anymore. You can bring it directly into Pro Tools and work on it. You can also do AAC export in MOV files in either constant bitrate or variable bitrate. There's also a huge number of new channel formats added to expanded bounds for MOV audio, starting with LCR all the way up to third order ambisonics. Apple Silicon, right? The hot topic for uh, a while. Again, this is one of those things that you, our customers have been asking for. And we are very happy to announce that Pro Tools is now qualified for Apple M1 computers over Rosetta. You can use Pro Tools over core audio or with the Pro Tools Carbon interface. We are still working very hard at bringing all these functionalities to Apple Silicon M1 with our HDX and HD native systems. However, as, you, as most of you know, this is a very brand new system where you need to do lots of work in the background. We are working very hard at it and we will have it soon, but just not yet. Same with video playback. Keep in mind, Apple Silicon support is now over Rosetta, so there is no video engine right now for Pro Tools. Last but not the least, last year, we introduced Dark Beam. Again, it was an instant hit. Our customers, all of you loved it. We also got lots of feedback. So we went back to our drawing board and made some more tweaks to that functionality. So two quick bullet points. One, you can now switch UI themes without having to restart Pro Tools. You can go between dark and classic uh, on the fly. You can also do lots of UI customizations, which we will take a look at right now. So I have my Pro Tools session open right here. And in the color palette, I have a UI customization option right here, where I can change between my classic theme or my dark theme with this one click. I also have five quick presets, which I can save depending on what kind of workflow I might be doing, right? This could be a situation where it's a room that's used by multiple staff member. 
someone might need visual accessibility features. They might need higher contrast, less brightness, so they can save a preset and click and bam, they're good to go. You can also save these as presets and share them between different workstations if you had to. And these are the multiple or the myriad of settings you have now. So you can actually change the text brightness, the background brightness, the track header brightness, timeline brightness. It's, you can dive in and change the waveform brightness for the clips, the grids, the marker lines, the automation view. You asked for it and here it is. So this release is for each and every one of you. So thank you. And with that, I will hand it over to Jeff who will walk us through some Yukon improvements. Awesome, thank you, Tony. Uh, so let's jump in and uh, I'm gonna share my screen here, first of all, and let's take a look at Yukon. There's some really fantastic stuff that we're excited about with 2021.6, which applies to the whole umbrella of Yukon. I'm gonna focus on S4S6. Gil's gonna, um, after that, uh, take a look at uh, specifically Avid Control S1, S3, etc. So let's actually dive in a bit here and talk about S4S6. There's some huge stuff in here. Here. Um, we're going to spend most of our time with the practical actually showing um, custom uh, mapping, both knobs and faders, because it is the number one feature people have been asking for for a very long time. Um, so happy to take you guys through that and show that. Uh, but in addition to that, there's some other great stuff in here. Uh, the ability to, to quickly change what you see in your option or attention knobs and faders on the desk. Uh, the ability to quickly change all of your display module views and zooms, whether they're channels or uh, masters or post, um, um, you know, displays. Uh, the ability to trigger soft keys based on a fader value, basically a fader star GPO, um, and and more, a lot more stuff. So. Um, Let's actually dive into uh, mapping and kind of talk about it. It's really cool. Um, it's very powerful. It's relatively simple to do, and it's actually portable, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, we're going to actually go through all three primary maps. That is the master module, the knob module, and the fader module. And um, uh, you kind of use them in a complementary manner um, where uh, you can really come up with uh, the workflow that's best for you. The cool thing about uh, mapping uh, is that, you know, there's never the perfect layout of page tables within a plugin. You want you can optimize for the way that you want to work. I think that is really what it's all about. So we're going to start by actually looking at the master module and uh, kind of want to just kind of introduce it and take you through some things kind of visually. Then we're going to actually do the practical. Uh, but the concept is basically uh, telling the system what you want to map. In this case, we're going to use the attention, um, the docked knobs on the master module. Touch custom, basically touch a knob to say, hey, well, I want to work on the S4 or S6 master module. And you can see it says, okay, great, here we go. What do you want to map first? Well, you start and grab a parameter, in this case, input, and say, okay, where do you want to put it? Then you essentially touch a physical encoder and you're going to correlate and kind of basically just iterate and going through that. Um, and we're going to actually take a look. I think Gil's actually going to do some stuff with the arouser as well. But I think it's a good application because it's not just a compressor where you've got you know threshold ratio attack release. It has some other goodness of saturation and filters whereby you may want to take advantage of those things that would not necessarily show up in a dedicated dynamics view. So I think that was a good thing to, to kind of bring up. Um, so the second thing we're going to look at which um, we've already had some functionality here, but this was faders and custom faders. Um, we've basically expanded now what you can do and the efficiency which, with which you can build these maps, which are very powerful. Taking clusters of parameters, dropping them in the faders, having unlimited pages, having dedicated bypass, some really, really great stuff. So let's actually get out of uh, Keynote here and we'll flip over and actually take a look at Pro Tools. And the first thing you're going to see is my desk. This is S4. Um, and basically, everything that we're going to do is, is really uh, analogous to S6 as well. So what I want to do is start by basically going and pressing the home switch. We're going to dive in. We've got a multi-channel ambience track that we're going to work on, which is right here, the Cessna. Um, I'm going to push in, and we're going to actually take a look at Altiverb. And uh, I just basically expanded in to see all the parameters on Altiverb on the center section. Now, we're going to do uh, basically touch custom in some I'm going to touch the custom button and what it does is it illuminates it says hey what do you want to map do you want to do faders do you want to do a 32 knob module do you want to do the encoders that are on the master module i'm going to say i want to work here first so i'm going to say yeah let's do master module so 
basically whatever makes sense to you what are the most important things that you want to work on in my case um you know certainly reverb time is really important and the cool thing about this new the new maps is that as you as you map you can interact with the parameters i think is really really important really powerful uh, you don't have to do everything kind of linearly you can do it in any order you choose um to me you know the the wet dry the mix percentage is also very important so i'm going to grab that Throw that over here. So there's the wet dry. Um, let's say I want to grab, um, you know, some uh, maybe some dampening um, parameters. So I can actually swipe through to see everything that's available, uh, and then I can touch. And it's going to ask a question. I'm going to actually come back to this in a second. This is a a, a really powerful ability to add additional uh, functionality. But I'm just going to do low, high, uh, low, mid, and high frequency dampening that I now have access to. In addition to my reverb time, I've got low, mid, and high. And you can see that right there, um, that dampening. Uh, and there's your reverb time. See that blooming. Um, so I've got one kind of column here built. Let's go to the other side real quick. And let's grab, um, I don't know, let's actually grab uh, maybe input output those are important certainly so we're going to go master input uh master output and maybe we creatively want to reverse the impulse sometimes so we can grab the reverse and throw that up there and you can see i can actually uh adjust the you know in invert the reverb the impulse response and so i've got two pages built i can keep going uh to my heart's content depending on what i want to do let's just add a page uh, right here. And let's say we want to control, this is a 5.1 uh, version of AltaVerb. So I want to control the fronts, the rears, the, the center, and the LFE bleed. So we're going to swipe down and find that stuff. So here's your front, here's your rear, here's your center, here's your LFE bleed. Um, if we hit play, you're not going to hear anything, but you're actually going to see, I can, you know, send to the center channel, bleed into the center, I can bleed into the LFE. So I'm actually controlling all the components of that, of that 5.1 uh, element. Let's take a look at the peer parameters real quick. And what this is all about, I'm gonna go and grab things like the direct gain, early reflection gain, tail gain, uh, those, those elements. So let's start with the direct gain. And it actually asked me a question. It says, do you wanna keep the switched functionality that the manufacturer created whereby the direct gain is on the knob and then you toggle with the switch to get into direct color? I'm gonna say, sure, that's great for right now. And that's kind of the default behavior. And then let's go grab early reflection gain and tail gain. Um, now, check this out. If you want to, you can actually pull off that discrete uh, direct color, which is really handy. Just like, uh, you know, the kind of the euphonic style frequency toggles into Q with the switch function. I can just retouch early uh, the direct gain and I can say, no, give me direct color specifically and put it here. And now I've got a, I don't have to dig into the cell switch to kind of toggle. You can see that's the same now as the second page of the direct uh of the direct gain uh, function you can see right here. Okay, so that's the idea. You can you can choose the explicit parameters you wanna pull off and grab. Once you're done with your map, you can hit done. And now I can either, you know, basically page between the two pages I created. I can certainly create more if I want, or I can say, you know what? I really want reverb time and the dampening stuff, but on the second side over here, I'd like to have the multi-channel controls, right? Of my front and rear. And I can kind of, you know, work uh, interleave and, and work on any of that I want. When I touch in on an, enco uh, on an insert path, it's gonna come back to my default state that I created. OK, so that's the beginning. That is the concept of creating a map. And this is, you know, two columns of four. And we're going to actually talk about this, but I could actually use this in the future for my B room, which has got Avid control with a dock. So let's actually segue into taking a look at the 32 grid of the, the knob module. In this case, it's part of a channel strip module, but it's exactly identical to a, a knob module in S6. So what are we going to do? We're going to make sure that Ultiverb is touched on the actual function scroller. We're going to press custom. It, it lights everything up again and says, hey, do you want to work on the faders? Do you want to work on the center section? Do you want to work on the knobs? I'm going to say, let's work on the knobs. And so it says, OK, great, here we go. The map is actually pretty good for the expand map for Ultiverb, but if I want to optimize it, make it better or make it more optimized for the way I work, I can do it in the same exact fashion. Again, start and pull out the important parameters that you want first. Let's go grab, uh, we're going to swipe back and grab reverb time. In my estimation, kind of the bottom left is kind of the most valuable parameter. And just me intuitively, I like mix percentage over on the right. That's just kind of my how my brain works. So it's over here. Um, input output kind of, uh, you know, intuitively to me, I would put it here. 
But again, you do whatever makes sense to you. There's your input output, there's your mix percentage. Um, let's take a look at some of the EQ and some of the kind of spectral stuff. Uh, let's just go and just do some, add some bass and treble right here. And then I want to take a look at peer parameters for, I want dedicated uh, gain frequency Q, gain fre frequency Q for the low and the high band. To do that, I'm going to do exactly what we did on the, um, on the master module. And basically what that is, is touch EQ low gain, put it somewhere. I'm going to put it here. And again, you can interact right when you grab it. Uh, EQ low freak. It says, hey, what do you want? Do you want to do switched? I'm going to say, no, I really want dedicated frequency. Put it here. And you know what? I really want dedicated Q. Put it here. I want to have as much control because I've got 32 knobs. Why not, you know, basically splay everything out? You might as well. Uh, EQ gain high. Great. EQ gain, uh, EQ freak specific. And then EQ freak again. I want Q. So let me tear off Q and put it here. So check it out. We've got basically now our, our low band gain frequency Q. Really great. High band gain fre frequency Q. I can uh, turn the whole EQ module on and off really easily there. Um, let's say we want our dampening back, which is also always very useful. I'm gonna keep this in a switched fashion. We're just gonna go uh, low, mid, and high. We'll do toggle. And just so you know, on underneath that nested under there are the crossovers. So I can actually use that cell to get to uh, the different crossovers. That's what's hidden underneath there based on what the manufacturer put together. So that's uh, kind of nice to know. Um, and then I can kind of obviously keep going in to my heart's content and figure out what I want. Certainly I'm gonna have a uh, want access to, and you know what, as you're working, if, if the orientation or where you put things is not quite ideal, you just write over it, right? So you basically just say, you know what, let's, uh, Let's just put our, our control of multi-channel stuff right here. I'm gonna burn over whatever I had there and we're gonna reorient, um, you know, kind of what we, what we did before, right? Just kind of work as you go. Add additional pages if you, if you want, that's absolutely an option. So page action add. And on page two, you know, maybe it's more esoteric parameters. Maybe it is in this case, I don't know, modulation, speed and depth, totally up to you, but you literally just add pages you can also have mirrored stuff. Personally, if my, my own kind of brain, I like to actually have things in similar places. So in my case, I like the idea, I like the concept of having mirrored stuff. And what do I mean by that? Well, page one, reverb time, really important, right? Mix uh, percentage, really important. Even if I'm pay on page two with more esoteric stuff, I still wanna have you know my wet dry and my input output. I think those are really important parameters and you can add as many pages as you want, figure out the orientation, figure out the parameters you want to tear off, where you want to put them, all that's good stuff. Um, and then when you're done, again, just hit done and you're good to go. So now when I actually go and push into an altiverb here, and I'm, I'm, I'm right now I'm in this, uh, you know, kind of an auto expand mode, if you will, it's going to pop into what I just created, which is, you know, exactly what we just talked about. And there's my multi-channel stuff. Uh, and then there is page two and my modulation stuff. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm good to go. So let's hit, take out of, get, go out of expand, okay? So super powerful, uh, whether you're creating something on the, on the, uh, the adjacent encoders on the master module, uh, the expand module, which is very, very powerful. And certainly if I go in Pro Tools and click on, if I click on Altiverb now, it's going to light up my dedicated, uh, I've actually set the dedicated encoder to, to, to target the first zone, the first attention knob, if you will, okay? And then my default behavior when I go and press attention again is gonna be EQ and Dyne, right? With my on attention stuff. So let's back out here a second. We'll pop back into Altiverb. I'm gonna hold down expand because I actually, I'm, I'm not in auto expand right now. And we're gonna now jump into, dive into the world of expand faders, which is, uh, also super powerful. We don't have the time to take you through every aspect of it, but I do want to go in and uh, do a little bit of mapping. So same exact workflow, make sure Altiverb is touched on the function scroller. So we're going to go and touch Altiverb, press custom. It says, hey, what do you want to map? Uh, I'm going to basically touch a fader. It's going to bring back a map that you were working on if it exists, right? And I've already got some stuff there, so let's actually work from here. Now let's make some changes. Let's maybe say I want to go and do input output and then keep my wet dry. So wet dry is right there, reverb time's right there, but maybe I want input output. So great, I'm going to grab, actually let's grab a couple things. Let's grab uh, EQ treble, EQ bass, and then maybe output. And I can basically just touch and put it right here. Right, so clusters of parameters, treble, bass, 
uh, master output wet dry. And then I'm going to burn over some of those things I did as well. Uh, grab those. I'm going to say yes, do a switch function and throw those right there. So I've got reverb time. I've got brightness. I got early reflections. I've got tail gain, all kinds of fun stuff. You have unlimited pages now, which is fantastic. You also have dedicated bypass, which means whether you're working on an EQ, a compressor, a reverb, you always have a dedicated bypass switch right here. I've got wet dry percentage for mix right here. If I hit uh, advance, I can go to the next page and you can see I've got gain frequency Q as we talked about previously. And I can turn my EQ module on and off. Uh, if I Again, if I wanna overwrite anything, very, very simple. Let's go to the last page here and just throw in some um, additional parameters. Maybe we'll throw uh, mod depth. Uh, yeah, let's go. Um, yeah, let's do mod depth and speed. We'll just overwrite what's right here. Okay, so now I've got modulation depth and speed. And I've got that parallel parameter of wet dry on the last fader. And that's just kind of the way I, I like it. When you're done with this guy, just press done once again, and you're good to go. So let's just kind of dive back in real quick and, and reorient. Reverb time, right? Center section, great. Dampening, great. If I pop in to expand on the knobs, I've got control. I've got my multi-channel controls here. I've got two pages. If I hold down expand, I'm now into expand faders, reverb time, brightness, wet, dry. Page three, I've got control over those multi-channel components, as you can see, modulation. I can bypass the whole thing. I can page back to page one. Uh, at any point, I can you know hold down the option key and I can null parameters, right? All kinds of great stuff. Pop out if you want to get back to your channel faders, you're back out and you still have control uh, from knobs or from the center section. So hopefully that gives you a, a little look at what is incredibly powerful. And it's most powerful because you can make it yours, make it be intuitive, kind of like a piece of outboard gear so that when you go in, it's very, very easy to operate. So, so Jeff, a uh, question came in and mm -hmm. once you, I know you answered this, but uh, a lot of stuff was going on there. Just want to go ahead and, and, and get some uh, clarification on it. Yeah. Are there only two pages to flip between on the knob modules? No. So there's unlimited pages um, in any of the different views, right? Whether I'm doing faders, whether I'm doing the 32, the 8x4 here, or whether I'm doing the 4x2, however many pages you want, you can do it. You can just keep adding pages or deleting pages. No limitations. All right, so um, uh, I think, um, can you hear me all right? Because I had lost audio there for a second. Yep, I think. yep, we got you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, let's go ahead and uh, grab my screen real quick. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what's new with Yukon with the smaller control surfaces. So there we go. So um, definitely some, some stuff that kind of overlaps here, but it works a little bit different. And that's what we're going to show you here. So we've got custom knob mapping from the uh, Avid control app. Um, and we'll show Uh, meter strip modes for the uh, tablets that are on your S1s, or if you're using the Avid Control desktop app with either S1, S3, this lets you basically build uh, a meter uh, bridge the way you want to look at it. We'll show that as well. But then there's also some other smaller features uh, that we have. Uh, we've got uh, locks build master to dock. We've got the ability depending, you might be on any one of the pages on your Avid Control app um, and controlling a uh, Yukon-based monitor section and don't want to jump over to the monitor page to see what your level is set at. Now, when you grab that knob and start to move it, there'll be a pop-up on the screen in the bottom right-hand corner to kind of show you what's going on there. Uh, another really great thing, especially for those uh, that do a lot of automation mixing with these surfaces, is now we have automation indicators
so you know which direction your automation is going in. Um, other things like being able to actually uh, name uh, your custom name, your speakers uh, and control source and speaker logic controls right from the monitor page without having to go into preferences or off into another app. A uh, bunch of new soft key settings as well as uh, little things like being able to quickly scroll into view and even a, a flip mode LED. So when you actually flip faders, uh, your knobs down to your faders, the flip uh, button will light up and, and flash. So it'll let you know exactly kind of what's going on. So um, what I want to do now is I'm going to stop sharing this. And uh, let me uh, get out of this real quick. Share my other screen. So uh, can you see my uh, setup now? Tony, Jeff? Yes, can you go. Not? yes. Okay, good. Just want to make sure uh, that we see that. Um, all right, great. So, um, so what we have now, uh, basically showing you uh, some S1s with uh, the control app uh, for the meter bridge, and we've got um, uh, a uh, screenshot of my actual uh, Avid control app that's on my dock. And so I kind of want to show, I'm going to go over first uh, kind of the custom map, DOM mapping uh, for the U-Control surfaces and, and show kind of the flexibility and how easy that is to use. So uh, the first thing is, is basically when a manufacturer puts a map out there from the factory, it's the same map for the encoders uh, in horizontal mode on the surfaces as it is with the four by two over here on the control app. So if I go over here into inserts and I pop into a browser, um, basically lays out my arouser and it's in the same exact order as if I came over here and popped into it on my uh, control app. Now that's not always necessarily uh, desirable. And you definitely have different workflow functionality when you're looking at uh, you know, a, a, a number of knobs in front of you on the surfaces versus what's going over here kind of on the center section. Um, and now we have this custom functionality. So when you go into a plugin on the channel strip page uh, of the app, you can see that there is a custom button up here. And if I tap into that, it basically takes us into a custom plugin editor, uh, similar to what Jeff was showing on the S4 earlier, but uh, there are some differences here. Uh, from here, we can choose to do a plug-in layout for the one by eight, which is kind of over here, what would be on our horizontal uh, knobs on the surface, or we can do a four by two. So right now I'm going to do one over here that's a four by eight, and it's probably kind of hard to see, but when I brought this up, basically it blanked out all of the encoders here, and basically it's going to let us build and, and, and see this uh, working in real time. So now all I've got to do is come over here from my list, grab, drag, and drop, and uh, very easily come over here and just start to build my own custom map. And as I'm building this, you'll actually see the parameters start to pop up over here, and I can actually interact like Jeff was saying earlier on the S4, S6. It's the same thing here. So as soon as you place something down, you can start working with it, see if it's something that you like. Uh, we're going to come over here, and we're going to grab our mix and put it down here in the corner put our dry trim above that, maybe uh, take our output up here and maybe go for some saturation. Now that gives us the first eight over here. I've still got another eight here. So all I got to do is come up here and touch this plus sign. It's going to add another page. And now I can start to add, you know, whatever else I want to this as well. And uh, just like Jeff was showing, you can actually have things show up on multiple pages if you want to. So if I wanted to put our um, uh, where's our, there's our mix. We put it down here in that, that bottom. So I've got mix kind of here at the end of each one of these. So really easy to kind of create that. And like I said, basically building this map out for this. And as of right now, as I, if I go out of custom, because I've only got the one map, it's showing that now over here on our, um, the control app as well. But in some instances, I might want this to be a totally different layout for how this is, is working over here. So if we go back into custom, I can go in now and choose to do a four by two layout. 
Now from here, I can build this totally separate. So whereas I had put the input or threshold control starting over here, I actually want that over here on the right side for this. So I'm gonna to start to bring all of this on this side now and uh, attack, release. And then I want my, uh, say my mix over here. Same thing, if I wanna build another page, I can do that and uh, bring our mix down there. So I've got multiple things and then I can start to drag stuff up. Now, if I place something somewhere and I don't want it, I can either come over here and hit the clear button to get rid of it, or I can uh, just drag on top of what's already there and just have it overwrite that. Once again, once I'm done, I can hit the custom button to go out of this. And now basically all of that information is now stored in that file. And I've got a separate map now, what's going here on my surface versus what I've got going over here on my control app. All right. so. Another really cool thing that you can do with the custom mapping is you can, uh, even though, you know, we've done a really good job of, of laying out uh, kind of the dynamics and the EQ uh, parameter sections, you know, kind of the, of, of, the, of the parameters that you can bring up, depending, and it doesn't matter what plugin you're using for that, if, if you might not like that layout. So you can actually adjust and go in and make custom versions of those things as well. So this allows you to really, on either a one by eight or a four by two as well, go in and for dynamics or EQ, build your own total custom maps up and uh, be able to work the way you want to. So uh, that's kind of in a nutshell, kind of what we have here for uh, custom mapping. Uh, so the next thing I actually wanna show you is the meter strip designer. And this is actually pretty cool. So um, to get to the meter strip designer, it's on the Avid Control app in the uh, gear setting. So we'll tap that top right corner of that gear and we'll go in there and you'll see in the, under the settings column, meter strip designer, we tap that. Now we have uh, our meter strip designer up. So the first thing you're gonna see on the far right side is what we call the strip preview. And that's what is basically showing up uh, as kind of uh, the meter that you have kind of selected at this point. From here, if all you want to do is just kind of rearrange things, like I might want to take the uh, channel name here that's highlighted and put it at the bottom. So I can just drag and drop that down here. And I, I might want to put the automation up by the, the meter and kind of leave everything else the way it is. Once I kind of get that set the way I want to, if I hit save, then my meters update on my tablets. And uh, it's just that easy. Now, if I want to really kind of dive in and build something totally different than what's there, the first thing I need to do is actually come over here and start to drag out uh, all of the parameters over here into the available items to kind of give us a, a starting point. So the one thing you can't drag out of the strip preview is the actual meter because that always has to be there. But now I actually have all of these uh, elements here that I can now start placing back into and start to create my meter view. So one thing, if you notice, when I drug the multi-graph out, which is normally uh, where you can switch between a pan, a dyne plot, or EQ plot views, uh, it basically broke those individual elements out from the multi-graph. So what I want to do is kind of have some things in a multi-graph, but then I want the pan actually separate. So to do that, we're going to drag the multi-graph back over to our strip preview. And then we're going to drag Dyne and EQ over. Now, once those are over, we can then drag those right there onto the multigraph. Now, Dyne and EQ are part of the multigraph, but then I'm going to actually come over here and place Pan as a separate thing. Then what I want is I want automation, and then I want uh, my track name. So I'm going to drag that over there. Now I've got all this in place to go ahead and, and make this active. I just hit Save, and then voila, you see... Uh, all of the uh, meters on my tablets on my S1 have now updated to this uh, new view. If I ever want to get back to uh, kind of a default state from what comes to the factory, all I've got to do is hit default and save, and now we're back to a starting point. You can also, as you're building something, if you've changed anything and, and want to go back to the last version that was, in this case, it would be default. All you got to do is hit cancel and it basically will uh, kind of let you start over and uh, get back to where you were. So 
Um, that is meter strip designer. Like I said, there's some other really nice goodness uh, going on uh, in this Yukon release. Uh, definitely uh, would tell you to go and check that stuff out and uh, get, get a hold of it. It's really, really cool release. A lot of really, really great things there. So we've got about 13, 14 minutes left of this. And I know we've got some questions that have come in. I'm going to bring Tony and Jeff uh, kind of back online. We're going to stop the share. You guys there? Yep. Yes. All right. All right. So uh, basically, uh, we've got some questions that have come in. I know that probably some of them have been answered, but uh, let's go ahead. And, and once again, we're, we're monitoring this q and if, uh, if you've got some questions, uh, you can go ahead and put them in here and we'll try to get to them here in the next few minutes. So first question that came in that I'd like for us to kind of answer here is can regular Pro Tools now use an HDX card with the new hybrid engine? So, I mean, I'll go ahead and take that one. It's a, a one that uh, probably needs a little bit of explaining. So when we introduced hybrid engine back with carbon back in uh, late last year in November of 2020, uh, carbon comes with Pro Tools and you can use the hybrid engine obviously uh, with Pro Tools on that version, or if you had Pro Tools Ultimate or wanted to upgrade to Pro Tools Ultimate, you could use Pro Tools Ultimate with the hybrid engine with Carbon. HDX is always and always will be tied to Pro Tools Ultimate. Uh, there with with the HDX card and uh, when Tony showed the uh, playback engine there, hybrid engine can be disabled. Uh, if you decide you want to go back and work with kind of the classic HDX mode uh, that we've always had before. And that can only really work with um, with uh, Pro Tools Ultimate. And so HDX is always going to be tied to Pro Tools Ultimate. And uh, at this time, it will not work with just a regular Pro Tools license. So you would need Ultimate to work with HDX. All right, so uh, another question that came in um, and uh, definitely got some, uh, uh, some, some different things. So um, I guess this one came in. Uh, Jeff, you might have answered another question for this gentleman. I'm going to go ahead and just read the question and see if we can answer it. So Restrio tracks output to surround formats. It'd be super helpful to have the front and front rear controls in the left right sides on one page um I, i'm assuming that he's talking about um for uh s4s6 um control i i'm not i, I he was talking since he was talking to you I, I i guess that's what um um just thought i'd bring that up so do you I mean, um yeah, no, I understand what he's asking. It's pr presumably uh, talking about uh, the custom fader map for the pan map. We actually have made some changes with with this version of Yukon for pan mappings, um, and it is a little bit more unified. However, if you did have a stereo track, uh, you know, feeding a multi-channel output, you would still, assuming you're unlinked, those states are unlinked, you would still have to have uh, either interleaved or allocate different pages to um, uh, to the left and the right uh, elements, parameters. So yeah, well, that's good feedback. And that's um, something that we'll definitely um, uh, give back to product management. I, and I understand what he's getting at. All right, so let's put that one away. Um... There's definitely some questions up here that um, uh, uh, just kind of are, are more generic uh, type questions. Um, there's a question came in, maybe Jeff, you can answer this one. I'm not quite sure about uh, kind of where this is going, but Atmos question, will there be a way to uh, ever be a way to replace the MP4 Atmos file with an MP4 video file of choice? Uh, I mean, there are, if you actually go to the, the Dolby knowledge base, there is actually a, and I don't know if I can find it in the next five seconds, but, uh, if you go to the developer.dolby.com and actually do a search, they, they actually do have some, um, there's some, like, uh, some tools that you can download to actually, uh, add picks to the, uh, to the, uh, Atmos audio that you export from the MP4, um, if you look in the knowledge base. So there are ways to do that. 
Um, I understand you're probably asking for a more simple built-in way to in, in dams or daps to do that, but that that would be a question deferred to Dolby, really. Um, so, but um, but do check out uh, developer.dolby.com and do a search in there. You'll find there are some workarounds. A uh, question came in. Uh, this one, uh, I, I believe, is referring to uh, the new functionality I was talking about uh, when you grab the control room num on a on the uh, actual uh, dock. Uh, and when you move it, there, there's a pop-up window. The question asks, could the control room knob be made to show the window simply by touching it? Uh, definitely great feedback. It's definitely uh, feedback that we've gotten already and we will definitely pass this back along uh, to the engineering teams and uh, see if we can't uh, make some changes to that in a future release. Uh, not promising anything, but uh, definitely good feedback there. And uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, see what we can do about that. Um, there is a question. Uh, can you bounce to QuickTime across video edits? Do you wanna, uh, I mean, I, I think what that means if there's multiple video edits on the timeline uh, on a video track in Pro Tools, can you bounce across them? And when you bounce to QuickTime, that's actually bouncing into a single file that basically will make a single file out of that. So the edits will no longer be there, um, but you you can definitely make a selection across those and have that create a new video file uh, from those edits and then bounce the audio into that. I think that's what you're asking and uh, that's how that would be done. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? Um, so a question, uh, Jeff, maybe you can help answer this one. Uh, is there an option to have the LRC, LFE, LSS, so on, on both outputs and buses? The default on the buses are, LCR, um, LFE, LSS, RSS, and so on. Right now. Um, hmm. So you're saying, we, so we've got the little pop-up preset that says, hey, what's your path order? And you're saying that only works uh, outputs and buses. I thought it applied to both. Does it not? I thought once you chose, maybe he's right. We'd have to take a look at that. I thought when you chose the little pop-up to choose whether you want SMPTE or film order or whatever, creating a new path uh, would set that well, maybe. It, it, the output path you can, the, the buses you can't at this time. It's kind of like the, the, the meter order. It kind of stays the way um, it's preset, uh, the way we have it. Uh, but obviously with the output, you can, when you're going out, you can actually change that. But because it's internal in Pro Tools, it, it stays a certain way. Definitely something that uh, has been asked in the past uh and uh, we'll definitely pass that back along as well as a feature request uh let's see what else do we have got about five minutes left here um uh is there an instrument or track recognition function if drag a drop and drag an mp4 file into a new workspace or flow. Uh, either one of you guys want to take a stab at that one? I'm not exact. I mean, if, if you're talking about uh, dragging and dropping an MP4 file from the workspace or from Finder, I mean, it'll create a new track for you or place it. I mean, you get a pop up window uh, for that. If that's what you're asking, then yes, if the, we we it, we do have that type of drag and drop. Now, if you're talking about for an actual trying to drag that type of file into like a a, a sampler instrument or something like that, then no, we don't have that type of drag and drop functionality at this time. And uh, hope that answers your question there. Um, have you guys been looking at this list? Is there anything else on here that you, you might be able to help answer? Yeah, what's the best way to record and prevent delay while mixing with delay compensation on? The short answer would be hybrid engine, right? So with either carbon or HTX, that gives you sub one millisecond latency. And 
as we hinted at earlier, that's one of those things that you listen to and get used to, you cannot go back, right? So that would be the best way to reduce your latency in your recording. Yep, and also because the rest of the mix is on uh, native mixer at that point, it's all buffered and in, in, in time aligned with that DSP path. So uh, yep. it's not definitely not something you have to worry about uh, dealing with after the fact. Correct, yeah, one click and you, you get all that. Uh, question, uh, will we see a controller with just 32 knobs in the S1 type format for plug-in control? Uh, good question. Uh, definitely had that question asked in the past and, uh, uh, you know, it's definitely something I think we would all welcome. Don't have any real answer to if we will be able to do that or not, but we will definitely pass that on as well and uh, get that as a, a request for a new product. All right, so we've got a couple minutes left. Um, got a couple more questions to come in here. Let me scan this real quick. Uh, so question here, and I think Tony, you just answered this. Uh, uh, when I have an HDX system with a DSP card, is it better with hybrid mode? And um, I, th I think anybody that's experienced hybrid engine, like Tony had just said, uh, absolutely. Uh, it's that's probably your best workflow uh, when, especially when recording. Um, you get that super low latency on the DSP path decoupled from the the native mixing engine, lets you have full track count, big mixes going on without having to worry about doing any kind of, of buffer switching uh, or anything like that. So it's it yep. definitely, it's definitely kind of the, the, the better thing. And we've also talked a little bit about the past. You also get uh, as far as if you're using a hybrid engine and you're using that DSP in maybe larger sessions to kind of offload some of the heavy lifting of certain plugins, uh, if you don't have maybe a, a, a super powerful computer, uh, as in, you know, in, in, in kind of comparison to just the classic HDX mode, uh, when you use hybrid engine in that way, it reduces, majorly reduces voice count because of all the hops that you're going back and forth between that hybrid engine and um, uh, the native mixer, as well as reduces all kinds of system latency with that as well. So there's you know, not even just for just recording uh, in low latency mode, but uh, there's definitely a lot of really, really good reasons to use hybrid mode with HDX. Yeah. Gil, just want to expand on that a bit. Uh, so Gil mentioned system latency, right? So yes, recording is one aspect of it. But if you're mixing on an S6 or an S4 or even S1, system latency means the moment you make a ride on the fader, you don't hear any more latency of, of that. This is also game changing, right? What you do is what you hear and not a few milliseconds later. So it all adds up. So having an HDX or hybrid engine active, yes, gives you low latency, but also gives you low tactile latency when using a surface and makes the whole mixing process seamless. Hey, Gil, we lost your audio. Wonderful. Uh, Jeff, do we have any other questions that you'd like to answer before we wrap? I think we are at the time. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for hanging with us for the session. And um, if you haven't checked out Yukon 2021.6 or Pro Tools with the hyper, uh, HDX uh, hybrid engine, please do. There's some really, really powerful and significant workflow and game changing features in here. So uh, check it out. There's um, a number of videos on YouTube as well and, and various uh, documentations on all of these things. So on behalf of myself, and Gil and Tony. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.